Let's go ahead and pull ourselves back in. We just got a little bit more to go. And what we want to do is we want to talk about the issue now of how we get all these model elements associated to a timeline so we can simulate the actual construction of all this. So that's actually a pretty straightforward process. It's all just involves selecting and kind of bringing everything together. But let me show you how it works because it's just really tying all these different little kind of threads together. It's going to start with there's a notion of a task timeline. And a task timeline is something that you can go ahead and create in Primavera, in Microsoft Project. You can even, it's just a, it's a table that just really shows tasks and start dates and stop dates. Okay. So you could do this in any program. I actually created a little timeline for this thing just in Microsoft Excel. Actually, I used another program to get it going with. But here's what it looks like. It's just basically every task has a number, it has a title, it has some predecessor information, then a start and a stop date. Okay? That's all it is. So you can go ahead and create this however you want to. You can use Primavera, you can use Microsoft Project or any other tool, or you could just put this in Excel. Whatever it is, it's going to be the easiest for you. But what you want to do is have some tasks that you're going to. What's that? Yes, in fact, it will turn it into a Gantt chart. Actually, what it'll do when we bring it into uh, Navisworks, it'll create a Gantt chart. It won't have the, uh, it, uh, the task interdependencies linked, okay? Because it doesn't understand that. But you know, I guess the idea is you'd keep your scheduling program doing whatever it's doing and then just re-import this. Okay, so I got a file in there. If I'm working in Excel, what I do is I say save as, and the format that to get out of Excel is just something called a CSV or a comma separated value format. Okay, that's just where you have all the different values, column, column, col column, comma, column, comma, comma, column, comma, column, carriage return. <laughs> Boy, try to say that. That's hard. <laughs> okay, we'll close that one up and we'll go back over to Navisworks and show you where it fits into that picture. In the world of Navisworks, this all happens in a tool called the Timeliner. So let's think about where the Timeliner is. The Timeliner, for me, is under the Home tab. It might be under your View tab. Let me kind of bring that up and show you it has a separate little window that comes up. Navisworks is full of windows and tabs. Let me go through, and I'll even lock that in place so it doesn't keep on popping away. Actually, it was locked in place. Let me pin it back in there. Okay. What we're going to start with doing is we can either create brand new tasks here. And if we created brand new tasks here, that would be fine. If we didn't want to go through and use another tool, we could say add a task. And we can say add a task and kind of put them right in here. Okay. But if I want to go through and bring in those other tasks, let me delete these. I'm just right clicking to get these. What I'll do is link it to a file and I will choose the links tab. And I'll say, add a link. I'll link it to a CSV file. Then I'll go out there and grab that thing. Oh, where did I put it here? I think I probably put it out in the L drive. So let me go out to there. Oh, actually, no, I know where I put it. For me, it's, well, let's go to the L drive one. I think that's in there. I'll go to Cats, Glenn. Session 19. I got a sample task timeline right there. I could bring that in there. When you bring it in there, you get the choice of some importing settings. I tell it that row one actually contains the column names. And then you can go through and map the different names in Navisworks' database to the different names in the CSV file. So I can say name, map it to a field like title. You start date, I'm going to map it to the field export, expected start, expected ends. I will say OK. Notice that it says right now the status of that is old. It just hasn't been synchronized yet. I can right click on that. And I can say uh, synchronize the tasks. And then when I go back, oops, I take that back. Let's try this again. Let me try to rebuild the tasks. There we go. And now we have a listing of these different tasks. Now, these different tasks are all kind of hanging around. Just they have imported the date formats and the time formats, all that type of stuff. We're looking pretty good. It doesn't actually have the predecessor information. If you want to check out the Gantt chart view, you can switch over to that. 
There it goes. And it's kind of showing that view. When we come back in here, I'm going to pull a few different columns around, just kind of set this up a little bit different. I'll collapse those columns. I'm not so concerned about those. I'm going to actually pay attention to this task type. I'm going to pay attention to this thing called attached. And the reason I'm paying attention to those, in task type, I get the choice of, for all these different tasks, you know, are they construction tasks? Are they demolition tasks? What are they? Because they show up a little bit differently. I'll say these are all construction tasks. I want to be able to say that's a construction task, but I'm not sure if that sticks all the way through. And I'll just get the first two floors. I'll let you get the rest on your own. Okay. Now what we want to do is for each of those different tasks, we want to go through and map different elements in the model to that task so we can simulate it and put it together. Okay. And the way that works is as follows. Remember those sets that are kind of hanging around over there? This is how you make it all work. You go through, and for each of these different tasks, you map it to one of those different sets. So we don't have very many sets set up right now. Okay? That's not going to work for us just yet, but let's go ahead and make that happen. So for example, if I want to get that floor slab and map it to the first task right here, what I want to do is I can either select it just in the model, because I can see it right there. I can say, add that to a set, add the current selection. And I'll call it the floor slab. Okay. Having created that set floor slab, I can now attach it to an activity. I can come down to the task time lighter and right click on that. I can say attach a set, and I'll attach it to floor slab. Okay, so that's how this works. You just go through and you keep on making sets and attaching things to it, making sets and attaching things to it. Okay, let's go ahead and do something a little more interesting. Next up, I want to try and get those level one columns. So let's take a look at that. Level one columns, we need to sort of figure out how to select them back over here in the tree. Go back to the standard view. It turns out the level one columns that I want to get are actually, they're not even in the architectural model. So let me just hide the architectural model since I don't really care about seeing that right now. I just really just want to see that structural model, which is kind of hanging in the background. Okay. In terms of selecting those, I could go through and on level one, just go through and grab them all. And you'll see they're all kind of hanging there on level one. And I can choose them. Okay. And I can say add those. Oops. Having selected them, you see they're all in green. I can add them over here, add the current selection, and I will call it OK, that'll work. Or let me show you another way to do it. If you want to go through and do the searching, because the searching may actually be a little bit easier in the long run to do this. Let me go back to that find items. It's kind of hanging around down here. I'm going to say, let's search inside the structural. What I'll do is say, let's go to in structural. I'll go to level one. And I'll say the name contains, and I'll just make it W10, since I know that's what it is. I'll find all those. Again, it's going to go through and select all those. Having to put that together, I can now say, just add the current search. Now, what's the difference between just adding them in manually as a group or putting them in through a search? This one, level one columns, will always only have the ones that were selected at the time you did it. It will never kind of keep on changing. Level one search, however, has a criteria. So if your model changes, it'll find the new ones that got added, and it'll change based upon whatever the current search gives you. Okay? So searching is actually a better way to do it. 
Okay, it just gives you more flexibility because then the search selection set always keeps on updating so that you, know, you set things up as searches. If you get five new windows in the model, you don't have to manually add them back into the selection. Okay, so that's generally a good way to do it. Let's add a few things. Okay, we'll go back to the task time letter. We got those columns, so I can come over here and say let's attach them. Let's at uh, attach a selection set. Let's get the searched columns. Okay, next up I want to get the beams on the first floor. Let's see if we can figure out where they are. They're actually kind of hiding around a little bit because they didn't actually show up on the first floor. I think the way they came in as part of the NWC formats a little bit off. Actually, let me do that. Put that back in there. There's the level two columns. Maybe we should get those first. Level two contains those. Let me find all those. Great. We'll save that away. That's the level two. Let's go back and see if we can get those beams, though. Those beams are, they're hiding under no level right now. We've got these W12 by 26s. Let's see if we can figure out something they all have in common. Here they all are hanging. What I'd like to do is get some nice, easy way of selecting them. Oh, Just to get us going, I'm betting they're all that right there. That is, because they sort of came in in the same order. Let me add that to the current selection, or add the current selection. That's going to be the uh, level one beams. I am just betting that based on this same scheme, if I come down here and I do the structural systems, which is that next group until I get back to the beams, those are all the beam systems, and there's a lot of them. There we go. I'm just betting those are all the beam systems on the first floor. Excellent. Let me add those. I'll call it. Okay, if we follow that same rule, I'm just betting that if we come on down here to there, we're going to get all the level two beams. And finally, if I come down here, I'll get the level, the, all the joists at that level. Now, I will admit this is not the best way to do it. What I'd like to do is come up with a good search criteria. But I got to sort of mess around a little bit since they put them all under the same level. I got to dig into the properties around that a little bit and sort of see what the placement level is. There's something about it that we can sort of distinguish between which are the first and the second floor ones because you'd hate to have to do this manually all the time. Let me say add that current selection. And I'll call that the level two joists. Okay, if you've gone through and you've created all those different elements or all those different selection sets, you can go back to Timeliner and just map them in there. So the level one beams, we'll map that into the level one joists will match into level one beam systems. The level one exterior walls will match into, actually I don't have anything for the exterior walls. We'll leave that one hanging for now. <laughs> level two columns. Level two beams. And finally, level two joists. Now, there are actually some groovy little rules in here. Okay. If you set this up properly, you can actually map the tasks based on 
I like the name of the selection set. If you get everything mapping just exactly the same, you can have that do that for you automatically. So that if you're careful about your naming, you don't have to sort of attach these all manually. It'll automatically attach them for you. But we'll leave it at that for now. Let's come on back. So I got some tasks. I got some items associated with those tasks. We are ready to simulate this thing. Let's show you how that works. Okay. I can look at the configuration options for just a second. The only ones I really want to pay attention to or really kind of give you some uh, sense about what's happening is under task types, the construction types, they come in at first at 90% the green, they're 90% transparent, they end up just being whatever color they are in the finished model. Okay. And before they're ready to show up, they just don't, or before they appear on the scene, before they're in the timeline, they just don't show up at all. They're none. Okay. Demolition items, they're going to be none in the early, they're going to start as red, and then they're going to go ultimately to be hidden. So you can simulate things coming, you can simulate things going. Okay. The other thing that's sort of an important thing for you to take a look at down here, though, is really how you want the simulation to start. I'm going to start by hiding everything, because when I hide everything, it's like starting from an empty site, and we'll build onto it. You could start from the model appearance, which is like eroding a site. Okay, or just changing a site. So you can sort of decide what it is you want to have happen. I'm going to say hide as a starting point. I can come on over to simulate, and we are just about ready to go. So as of Wednesday, 126, 2011, day one, week one, there's really nothing on the site. It kind of looks pretty empty right now. And that's because, based on our timeline, nothing has appeared just yet. We told it to hide everything. Let me just say run and see what happens. What it's doing is based on the information in the timeline about the timing of elements and the elements you've associated with each of those things, it's just adding them in at each specific point in time. So it's just building things and it's just showing you how things work. Okay? Having done that, let's come down here. We got this nice little slider here, which will show us everywhere from April 22nd all the way down to January 26th. Is it still going? Let me stop it. I can slide this thing, and you can sort of see day by day, week by week, and you can choose which increment you want. You know, everything's showing up on site. We can go through and do that from other viewpoints, too. For example, that's kind of a little bit close. I can pop it out to here and do the same thing. Or I can even go through and get in very close. And again, sort of either show it coming or going. So to make this work effectively, the important thing is you have to sort of get things associated with the timeline, you get the elements associated with it, and then based upon which elements you're showing, they'll start popping away in there. Again, I chose hide everything first. That's hiding everything that's not associated with the timeline. Okay. Once you've gone through and created your animation, let's kind of pop back out there. What you do is, let's go back to Timeliner. We got our animation. It's kind of doing whatever it's supposed to be doing, hopefully looking good. When you are all ready to export this thing, here's what you got to do. You go up to the, uh, the application menu or the file menu. You say export. You choose that you want to export it as an animation. And then watch out for these settings. You want to do a timeliner simulation. You want to choose what type, whether you want it to be a JPEG file or a series of JPEG files or a Windows AVI, and that's what you want. You can set how many frames per minute, the size of the window, and whether there's any anti-aliasing. And when you say OK, then you can go ahead and save that away out to your disk. Okay, and that way, you can go through and share this with someone else. Okay. And really, that's what we have in mind. So if you go through and are working on that piece for the assignment, that's what you need to come up with, is ultimately just come up with that movie. Get things associated. Probably about 20 tasks is enough, because really I'm looking at it that way in terms of first level, beams, columns, joists, second level, columns, beams, joists, third level, put a roof on it, 
you know, it's, we really wanted it about that level. You don't have to be going through and thinking about everything in incredible detail. OK? Because the point of the exercise is really just to go through and do that mapping and it's generate uh, some sort of an animation out of it. Okay. That's where we'll leave you on the animation side. Let me show you just one other kind of really cool capability of this. And that is the whole idea of clash detection. And we'll sort of finish there. Okay. The idea with clash detection is as follows. Okay. We're actually going to look at something called clash detection. And the idea is if I have my architectural model, you have a structural model, you have a model of the HVAC system or the plumbing, okay. all those things come together. And very often, because we plan them independently, Okay, things don't actually resolve nicely. We have things that are in the same place and are intersecting each other. And we need to find those issues so we can go through and make those changes or you know, fix those design problems before we actually get to the field. Okay, so let's show you where you would actually take a look at that. There's this tool within Navisworks called Clash Detective. And let's tell you how you use it. The idea is as follows. There's the Clash Detective here. Okay, and within the Clash Detective, we're going to basically go through and set up a selection set where we're going to pick items that we want to look at and compare to each other and see if they intersect. So for example, we can go into the architectural tree. Okay? We can go over here to uh, the, uh, set up something over on the other side. And then based on those two things, we can go through and sort of see if things are intersecting with each other. Let's take a look and see, see, what I, see what we have in mind. So for example, if we want to, at a really high level, we can go through and just start thinking about, you know, do the architectural elements intersect with the structural elements? Are we having any problems like that? Okay, so how we would go ahead and check for that is we could, at a high level, just say, let's take a look at the whole architectural model, and we can compare it to the whole structural model. Now doing that, it turns out we'll actually have an awful lot of intersections because the way we've modeled this, you know, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be uh, kind of intersecting with each other. So let's go through and kind of actually be a little bit finer than that. Okay, let's go ahead and say that, oh, what do I want to do? I did notice that we were having a problem, for example, oh, let's see if I can find this. Let's see if I can find the stairs. There it is. Jeez Louise. OK. If I, for example, want to go through and take a look at where those stairs are relative to the structural elements, let me go ahead and try just doing a clash detection on those. So I got the stairs selected in the architectural set. I have the joists, or just really all the elements of the structural system selected in the other one. What I'm going to do is do a hard detection. The hard detection is actually going to look for things where they intersect, okay, as opposed to a clearance which is where things are within a few inches of each other. We want to go through and kind of look for things that are, we can also look for duplicates, which are things that are actually two different instances of the same thing. Let me say that we want to go through and do the clash detection. It actually found two different cases where the risers, okay, the stair, and the structural thing are actually clashing with each other. Let's take a look at that. We go to the results. Okay, and we have clash one and clash two. Let's go ahead and take a look at these different issues. If I go through and choose one, it'll actually sort of show me. Let me go through and say auto reveal, and I can sort of dim the other things. Oh, let me kind of close some of these other things over here so you get a better sense of where everything is. So basically, what it's showing me in one of the clashes, the stairs are actually intersecting. What is it over here? There's a W12 by 26. So if I orbit around there, those stairs, can you see where the beam is actually coming and it's actually hitting the stairs right there? Okay, that's not very good. So that's something we want to go ahead and mark up as something that needs some sort of clarification. Let's take a look at the other one. Looks like we have something else going on over here. Let me again sort of orbit around. Looks like that's just the second one happening down on the second floor. Okay, so we got a little clash between those things. Okay, what we want to do on each of those different things is what really we want to go through and sort of mark those, say that those are some sort of issue that we want to go through and be able to uh, like identify later. So the idea is we have some clashes. 
we can classify those clashes as new, active, reviewed, approved, or resolved. Because ultimately, here's what you're doing. You're creating a hit list, a bug list of all these different things that have to be resolved. And all these issues ultimately want to get forwarded to different people to go ahead and solve. So I got an issue here. I got to decide, is the architect going to move the stairs? Is the beam going to move a little bit relative to the stairs? The structural engineer is going to do that. Or is that actually OK? Is that just a modeling error, and I'm going to leave it be? You know, because there are definitely some things where things appear to be touching, but we don't really care about it. Okay, so you classify all these things. At the tail end of all this process, you can go through and produce a report in an HTML format. It'll give all this information. And let me do that. Let's see what that actually looks like. Documents, stairs versus structures, HTML. There it is. Let's see what's in that report. OK, so there's some sort of hard clash. It's at this point in the model. But we're going through and actually getting a hard listing of really what this problem is. Actually, here they're overlapping. It's only by 0.04 feet. So it's very small in terms of what's going on. But there's a little bit of a clash there. Okay. So that's where we want to leave you there. Clash detective, don't worry about having to do it relative to what you're doing for the assignment, but know it's there, because that's actually one of the best uses of Navisworks. That's where we try and save a lot of money using Navisworks. Let us go ahead and wrap with just a couple of ideas. And they're as follows. Okay, As we finish up the class, I always like to go back and kind of take a look at really where we started and kind of revisit some of that to kind of see how far we've progressed. And as we think about BIM and BIM modeling, the important point I want to reinforce as you depart from this class is just this whole notion that really when we talk about BIM, confusion abounds. There are so many different things that people think of as BIM that no one's quite sure if they're talking about the same thing. So when you go to a company and they're asking you, oh, do you, do you know how to use BIM? They could be talking about, do you know how to use Revit? They could be talking about, do you know how to use any sort of CAD or 3D modeling tool? They could be talking about not just the tools, but the whole process of doing things, putting building information into a 3D model, and then being able to query it and do analysis off of it, and really use it to kind of manage the information as it flows through a project. But there's a lot of confusion. There's really this whole notion. People are very confused about, are we talking about a noun? Are we talking about a verb? Just really, what are we talking about here? And I'm going to advocate that we actually think about it not just as narrowly as this tool that is running today on this one version, but you actually think of it as really being a much broader thing, that it's really a process. Okay, and that's really where the power comes out of this. Okay. As we think about changes and process and how things work, it's important to note that we're really at a very early stage in the adoption of BIM right now. That really, if I had to characterize where we are, I think we're somewhere down in here. I think we're down at the early adopter stage. You know, we haven't even got to the point where we're having to cross the gap just yet. Okay? Because you will find some municipalities, some government agencies are starting to require BIM. But it's just that. Okay, we know we should be requiring BIM, so we put that in as one of the requirements for bidding on the project, or you know, just qualifying to participate in the project. What that actually means, though, no one really knows. And if you start digging in deeper, there really aren't very many detailed criteria. So we often have, like, what if I characterize the entire industry, I'd say that overall, the construction industry tends to lag a lot of industries. We're not really very high technology adopters. We tend to do things the way we've done them for the last 30 years because we like it that way. It's safe, it's known, it's non-threatening. It may not be very efficient, but we at least know what we're getting into. What's happening is, though, early adopters, there are some companies, especially some ones here in the Silicon Valley, that are closely related to SIFI and some of the work we're doing here, which are, they're really just pushing the limits of where this can go. Yeah. They're not just going ahead and trying to use BIM to sort of make the production of construction documents more efficient. They're actually using the information in the building model to really try to manage the entire process, to bring the designers and the constructors and the facilities managers and owners all together and use it that way. So you'll have some early adopters which are on the early part of this curve, but it's going to be a while till we get over that hump and actually start having BIM become the standard and have everyone have a, a definition of really what it means. So as we think about it as a process, it's important to know that this is sort of a real paradigm shift for a lot of people. 
it's not just taking a CAD tool and producing construction documents faster or more accurately. That really, in the same sense as some of these other paradigm shifts, there was the whole notion, oh, we have a lot of them going on right now. You know, way back when we used to write letters. You know, and I'd dictate a letter and your secretary would type it. Then I'd mail it to you and three or four days later you'd get it. And then you'd take a few days and respond to it. Then you'd send a response back. And you know, one round of communication took like two weeks. Okay, FedEx was a fantastic thing because I could wait till three o'clock that day and get the documents turned in somewhere and they'd show up on the other side of the country the next day. And that was really a fantastic thing. It changed the way we worked. Then the fax machine showed up. All of a sudden now, I could actually get something to you in minutes, not in hours. Okay, the internet, I can get things to you in seconds. And nowadays, you don't even have to wait for it. You can go to your smartphone, or your pad, or your tablet, whatever, and just pull it up in the field. And this technology is kind of cool, but the important thing is it's really changed the whole paradigm about how we're working. Same way, for example, in entertainment. You know, it has been that you had to go through albums, then there were eight tracks of cassettes. But when we shift to iTunes, it's not just that the media went digital, it changes the way we buy music. No one goes ahead and buys, well, some people buy CDs anymore. We used to have the CD of the month club, things like that, where you pay a penny and you get a bunch of them. Yeah, you don't do that anymore. You get exactly what you want. Even in terms as we think about marketing, the whole days of glossy brochures and all this marketing materials is really going away where now everything's all about social media and viral marketing campaigns. We're just fundamentally changed the way we're doing things. And if you can sort of understand these paradigm shifts, you got to think about what's going to happen to the construction industry. The same sort of shift is going to happen. We don't even know what that shift is going to bring us right now because we're so early in the process. But that whole notion of having to have designers over here and constructors over here and owners over there and somehow I'm going to keep on throwing documents to you and we're all going to sue each other if anything goes wrong, that's going to change because it just can't keep on working that way. It's too fluid now. So as we go through and do this change, remember there are always facilitators. There are people who are going to advocate the change. There's also people who are going to resist the change. Change is a threatening thing. A lot of people just don't like change. And it, for each of those different folks, you've got to think, what do they stand to win? And also think about, what are they risking? Because for every change, status quo is safe. It may not be great, but it's safe. We know what we're getting into. Change is sort of just a little bit unknown. So as we think about that, if I share my information in you, with you, I may get more efficiency. But then again, I may be taking on more risk. Because if you depend on my information and you make a mistake, all of a sudden, you may come back and try to get after me because I gave you information that wasn't completely accurate. It may have been accurate enough for what I needed, but for me to anticipate how to format the information in a way that you're going to be able to use it is pretty tricky. You know, to make sure that you're not going to do something to abuse it and get yourself in trouble with my information, that's pretty hard. So that gets to the final point here. To really make this work, we have to think about it differently and restructure our relationships. That in the same sense that we had design build in the past, now we need to think about what our organizational relationships are and what our contractual relationships are going to be very differently. Because this whole notion that it's, you know, I'm going to win or you're going to win or somehow we're going to litigate to figure out like who is in between, okay, doesn't going to work anymore. Nowadays, we really have to sort of accept the notion that we're really all part of a project team, okay, and that really the whole project is either going to go succeed together or sink together. And if a mistake is made, it's not that I'm going to come blame you and sue you for that. It's that a mistake got made. You know, but you know, within that, we have <laughs> ways of dealing with sort of you know, recovering the cost of that mistake and also sharing in the rewards in case things go better. Okay? And there's going to be some classes you'll take throughout the year that just kind of keep on pushing on that point. It's not just this technology. This is just an enabler. To really make this work, it's all about the process and the people and how we structure that. Because this is just sort of a necessary, but it's not sufficient. Finally, for you, I really want you to think very carefully about really what your role is going to be in this. Because there's just so many different hats. As we go through and transform a whole industry, there's so many different things for people to work on. If you love the technology, you love tool development, there's going to be a whole host of us who are going to go off and just work for the software developers and come up with better ways to get information to flow back and forth. Okay. If you're a more business minded, the whole notion of how we're going to change our processes and implement new strategies to give us some sort of strategic advantage and just really fundamentally change the mechanics of how the business works, there's plenty going on there. In fact, that I think is the richest area right there. Okay. 
In terms of the BIM implementation, a lot of you, when you get out of here, you're going to go to companies where they're not so familiar with the tools, and they're really going to look to you. They'll say, hey, you know how to use Revit? Super. Sit on down. You know, you're going to teach us how to do this stuff, and you're going to be involved in this BIM implementation and helping them to develop standards and ways of working with the tools. Finally, there's going to be a role for people who just evangelize, who just sort of spread the word and just you know, promote that this is the way to do it. Stop thinking about going backwards. It may be a little painful, but we have to kind of keep on going forward because there is a very nice light at the end of that tunnel. So choose the one that you think fits best because that's what you're going to target. But also be ready to switch hats as necessary because I can attest to it in my own career and I think you'll find the same thing. We all start off in one direction, but you know, you just kind of opportunistically kind of keep on moving around where you're necessary. And I'm just betting by the time you get through, you're going to end up wearing all these hats at one point or another. Okay, so just be ready for that. Okay, let us adjourn there. Let me say that this has been a fantastic class. I am just like so s just stupefied by really what you guys have been accomplishing because without a doubt, you know, what you've been producing, what you've been doing is so far above what we've done in the past. I don't know what it is. I think you got one got started and you kind of kept on just ratcheting it up and the bar kept on getting higher. But the quality of the projects and what you're doing, is just, it really is just stupefying. It's fantastic. And I want you to be so proud of what you've been accomplishing. Because you know, although you're still struggling with a little software over here and Revit will fight you over there and you're not quite getting things 100% the way you'd like to, you got to look back at where you were 10 weeks ago to where you are now. And really, you're masters of these tools. What you can do now is what people have been you know, struggling to do with years of experience. And you're just kind of producing this stuff so, so fluidly now. So I want you to all just be very proud of yourself about what you've accomplished and really kind of take this and kind of keep on pushing that technology. Because we'll adjourn this class, but you know, hey, we're going to continue to be around supporting you. So as you have questions in other classes and try to keep on applying it, you know, I really want just really as for us to stay together as a community that keeps on supporting each other because really, you know, that's the way it's going to work. We're just going to get each other through the whole process and keep on applying and learning from each other. Okay, so thank you for a fantastic experience. We'll continue to be around through the week, helping you out with some different things. But let's go ahead and break for today and let you get on with uh, the rest of everything you have to get done this week. Okay, take care.